All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Good evening. This is Sharon from the Alumni Office, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Checking In with Students, Formative Assessment Tools That Work presented by Chrissy Romano Arabito, a William Patterson alumna who received her master's in education from William Patterson in 2004. This session will address the need for formative assessment in the classroom and the various forms of formative assessment from high-tech to low-tech to no-tech. Before I introduce, introduce today's presenter, I'd like to go over how this webinar will work. First of all, you should be able to see the presentation on your computer screen. You will also be able to hear the presentation through your computer's audio system. Please feel free to ask questions by typing them in. We will be monitoring your questions and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. And don't be shy. If you have a question, please ask so that we can um, answer any questions that you may have. Um, and now I'd like to introduce today's topic and speaker. Chrissy Romano Arabito is a veteran teacher with over 24 years experience with students in elementary and middle school. She has spent the bulk of her career teaching in Hackensack, where she was born and raised. She graduated from Rutgers University with a double major in sociology and psychology and went on to complete the teacher certification program. She then earned a master's in counseling from William Patterson University. Chrissy is, a, is dedicated to teaching the whole child, as well as stimulating and supporting innovation in classrooms. Chrissy continues to be passionate about teaching and infusing technology to engage and motivate students. She is a Google for Education certified trainer and provides educational consulting and training to educators on the East Coast. She is a co-host of Hashtag Coffee EDU, an informal monthly gathering of educators in Westwood. And she's the co-director of NJASCD North a lead organizer of EdCamp New Jersey and an overall EdCamp enthusiast. So now I would like to introduce, introduce our presenter, Chrissy Romano Arabito. Chrissy? Hi, everybody. That's quite an introduction, Sharon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So today we're going to talk a little bit about formative um, assessment. And as Sharon mentioned, there's going to be some low-tech versions as well as high-tech versions because you never know what your setting is going to be um, and if you're going to have access to technology or not. Okay, technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. So we're going to start off first by just talking a little bit about the difference between what formative and summative assessment really is. When we were growing up and we were in school, most of the assessment that took place was summative assessment. You were given material by the teacher, they taught you something, um, you processed that material, you did some homework on it, and then you took a test or a quiz. That's pretty much what most of us were used to um, when we were in school. And that's summative assessment. It's when you are looking at what the kids can do after they learned whatever material it is that, um, that you shared with them. Formative assessment is very popular in schools today. And it's when we take a look at what the kids are doing during the learning. Formative assessment is really what we use to inform our instruction. So as the kids are learning the material, you're kind of tapping into what they're doing during the process. Because it really doesn't make sense to wait until the very end of an entire chapter or a unit or whatever lessons that you're doing to see if the kids understood it. And then you've lost a lot of valuable time. So it kind of makes sense that while they're actually in the process, we as teachers should be tapping in and seeing, are they getting it, are they not, and what should we be planning for the next day's lesson? So by the way, I know Sharon mentioned before, but I do want to mention it again. Um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to type them in. So I'm going to be honest, I'm used to presenting in person, and I'm used to a very interactive experience. So it's a little weird for me to just kind of be talking at the computer. So please don't, don't hesitate to jump in and ask questions. So the idea of catching kids in the middle of the process, of the learning process, it's really um, all about feedback. And this is what it kind of looks like for the teacher. So when you're sitting there and you're pulling up with a kid, you're having a conference, if you're um, in a reader's, writer's workshop situation, if you are teaching, um, 
math or any sort of small group instruction, and you're actually sitting there pulling up with a kid, these are some of the questions as a teacher that you should be thinking about. And they're, they're pretty self-explanatory right there. So we really want to try to get a feel for, are the kids getting it, are they not getting it? And if they're not, what can we do um, to make sure that we can make the learning process a little bit easier for them? And then as a kid, as the student, these are some of the things that the kids are probably thinking, right? Or we hope that they're thinking. <laughs> Maybe they're not, but we hope that they are. So now we're gonna kind of dig into some ways that while we are teaching to make sure that the kids are understanding the material. And we're gonna start with a real easy, no tech um, formative assessment. It's simply called thumbs up, thumbs down. So this is really easy. So if you're standing at the front of the room or you're walking with, working with a small group, no matter what content area you are in, when, whatever specialty it is, you simply can ask the kids, does this make sense? Are you getting it? Give me a thumbs up if this is clear. You know, give me a thumbs down if you need me to go back and, and explain it differently or go over it again. Um, and same idea with, with fingers up. I mean, you could do um, something along the lines, you know, if this is solid and you understand it really, really well and I can move forward, show me five fingers. And now, you know, the flip side of that would be if you really don't get it and, and you know, um, you want me to explain it again or you feel like you need to come um, to a strategy group so I can, you know, work in a small group and, and or you need additional work in that area, you would do like one finger. And then of course, there's any variation in between. You can kind of set those parameters with your students ahead of time. Um, so they kind of have the basic idea. So five fingers could be totally got it, Ms. Romano. I totally understand it. This is good. Let's keep moving. Um, one figure, finger, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is really confusing. Um, I can't follow. And then maybe three fingers. It's like, mm, I kind of get it, but I'm not comfortable. So as the teacher, what you do is, you know, you kind of make note of that. And then when you pull your small groups or your strategy groups, or you're deciding on your mini lessons for the next day, you get a judge immediately. Okay, the majority of the class got it, but these th three kids don't really understand it. So those are the kids that I'm going to pull, you know, for a small group. So hopefully that makes sense so far. And usually what I do, if you're sitting in front of me, I'll say, give me a you know, thumbs up if this makes sense, or thumbs down if you want more explanation. Sharon, how are we doing so far? Sounds good. And it looks great. OK. So more high-tech version, Google Forms. So probably, and I'm assuming that most of you that are here today are pre-service teachers. So I'm not quite sure if you've done your student teaching or if you're familiar with G Suite. Um, it used to be called Google Apps for Education or GAF, but they switched up the name not too long ago. It's now known as G Suite. Um, so probably most of you have filled out a Google form at some point in time, either to answer questions on a survey um, and using it as some sort of information gathering tool. So we as teachers can use Google Forms in lots of different ways. So what I actually did for you here today is I'm gonna give you some examples um, and these are different types of forms that you can use in your classroom to collect information. So the first one we have here, we give it a second for it to load. Um, a simple question that I asked parents um, at back to school night. So when I used this one in the classroom, I was in a middle school setting. I was a fifth grade teacher and the students in my class were coming from four elementary schools around the district. So I wanted to have an idea of who I was going to be dealing with um, over the next 10 months in school. So I had Chromebooks uh, set up in the classroom. And again, you can use any device that you have available to you. And I had the parents answer a very simple question. How do you feel about having your child enter middle school? So they had the choices of being excited, nervous. Wow, time flies. I can't believe I have a middle school kid. Not sure how I feel, and then I gave them the option um, for other. So the really cool thing about this information is I really got a feel for what kind of parents did I have. Did I have a lot of you know parents that um, are, are nervous about the experience? And those are the people when you get that information, you want to reach out to them. You want to make sure that they feel comfortable with their kid coming into middle school. Um, and some of you may be saying, if you're not really familiar 
well, where does all this information go? So when you create a Google form, you're collecting data using the form, but the data automatically goes to a Google spreadsheet. And then once you have that spreadsheet, you're able to manipulate and analyze the, analyze the data like you would in any other one. And here is a sample of a spreadsheet. So right now we can see, um, let's see if I go up to data here. Nope, I think it's tools. Let's see where it is. They might have moved it around. Okay, I'm looking for the pie chart and I'm not quite seeing it here. Oh, here it is, show summary of responses. There we go. Oops, that's an old form. Oh, there you go. And there we go. We're able to see quickly um, and easily who you have sitting in your class. So the majority of teacher uh, parents are excited here. Um, we have a bunch that just can't believe they have a middle school kid. And you have like almost 19% that are pretty nervous about their kid being in middle school. So those are the parents that you want to make sure that you reach out to. Um, and if you click on individual, you'll be able to see as well. Um, actually, you know what? Not in this case. But, oh, yeah, here we go. If they were logged in, in this case, they're not going to be able to see because we didn't collect the actual um, login information. You'd be able to have a feel for who these, who these parents actually are. So there's an example um, of one type of a Google form that you can use. Here's another one. You can use it for surveys to just find out information about the kids in your class. So this one is a very simple one, which we call a student information survey. It asks kids about how they get to school, how do they get home from school, um, do they usually bring lunch, what's their favorite subject, their least favorite subject, and so on. You can literally ask any question that you want. When I was at the middle school uh, for 15 years, I was an English teacher. So one of the things that I was most interested in was finding out their, what these kids were like as readers and writers. I do the same thing now at the elementary level. Just to get a feel for, do I have kids that like to read? Do I have reluctant readers? Do I have kids that are you know, avid writers or kids that is gonna be pulling teeth to get them to write anything on the page? And again, having this information and this data at your fingertips helps to inform your instruction and it gives you a better idea of who is sitting in front of you. Hey, Christy, this is Sharon. Sure. So, um, I'm not sure how many people on the webinar are pre-service or are teachers, but um, I'm just curious, you, you make these forms yourself as the, as yes. the great. So I don't know how many people on here have done that. Maybe if they want to, you know, volunteer anything or if they're just learning about doing it, it would be interesting to know, I think. But go okay, ahead. So you're asking yeah, them that question? If anybody wants to put in, you know, if they've done it or if they're learning about it now, I, I would, we would love to hear it. So. But go ahead and continue while they type. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, another way that you can use Google Forms to tap into, you know, what's going on with your kids is for reflection. Um, so here we have, um, this was something that a colleague of mine did after she was teaching um, social studies. So it was after a unit on Westward Expansion. So she's collecting their name there. Did they enjoy the activity? What did you like most? What did you like least? what's something you would change um, and then you know having them it was a group activity having them rate themselves so one of the really important things as a teacher as a person but just even as a teacher is to to give kids the opportunity to reflect upon what they're doing and then as teachers to reflect upon your instruction because I can't tell you how many times in my 24 years of teaching that I think something went really, really well, and I thought the kids were super engaged, and that if I had to do it again, and if I made them do something similar, they would jump at the opportunity because it was just so much fun. And then when you actually ask them, you realize they were not really engaged. They were just being compliant because they were good little boys and girls. <laughs> they were doing what they should be doing, but they really didn't like it, and it wasn't really fun. So it, it does behoove you as a teacher to stop and take stock of what you're doing and ask the kids. Um, and something like this, if you weren't asking them to grade themselves, you might just do something anonymous. 
Um, I do a reflection at the end of every school year where I ask the kids out of all the different things that we've done, and we kind of brainstorm first, we chart it out either on chart paper or on the smart board, and we'll you know, go back and reflect upon the school year. You know, What are the different things that we did? And then I ask them to honestly, and it's an anonymous Google form, you know, go in and please tell me, what did you enjoy? And if so, what was it that you enjoyed about it? What did you not like? And why did you not like it? Um, it's really great to get a feel for what the kids are thinking, and it's gonna help you plan for the following year. Because again, there's many, many times as an adult, we think something, you know, we just, you know, hit it out of the park, but when it comes right down to it, it, it you know, the kids really weren't interested. Um, and then finally here, we have another quick assessment. So this was actually created by a special ed uh, teacher in my school. And you could also use these, um, these Google Forms for either do nows or bell ringers, like something that you do as soon as the kids walk in the room. So the devices are out or as soon as they come in, they take out their device, they log in and they answer right away. It's to get a feel for, did they really truly internalize and understand and remember what you taught them the day before? On the flip side, an exit ticket is when they're walking out the door in those last three minutes or five minutes do quick one, two, maybe three questions to see if the kids really got what you were teaching. So here's one, how many um, planets do we have in our solar system? Uh, inner planets, outer planets, you know, different vocabulary here. Um, list the names of the planets and so on. Um, and Aaron, who actually created this a couple of years ago, um, would do this just to see did her kids get it? Because again, she was teaching special ed and that particular year she had kids that it literally, it was like, information was going in one ear and out the other. So she really needed to know right in that moment when they walked in the door, can I move forward with new material or do I need to go back and reteach in a slightly different way? So for those of you that are pre-service teachers, have your plan A, what's in your lesson book, you know, your lesson plans ready to go, but kind of always have like that plan B. <laughs> if you walk in and you realize, yeah, they really didn't get it even though I thought that they did, and you have another way to kind of attack whatever concept it is or scale or strategy. So, um, you know, you have another way of, of explaining the information. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, and I also gave you some additional resources as well. So here you're gonna see, we're gonna do a no tech and then a high tech and we're back to a no tech again. Um, most of us are familiar with the red solo cup. Right, we've seen those all before. When you go to Party City or one of those stores these days, you can find these cups in a zillion different colors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've seen this done a couple of ways where if you have your kids working in groups or sitting at tables, that you place a green cup, a red cup um, there for them. You don't necessarily have to label them. If you teach your kids in advance what they stand for, green is go. I got it. You know, if you're working in a, in a um, small group setting or the kids are working collaborati collaboratively or, you know, working as a team and they understand what's going on and they're moving ahead and there's no issues, then you have the green cup. Um, if there's issues or they don't understand something, they simply flip it over and there's the red cup. So you could do this a couple of different ways. You could literally take those two cups, put them, um, and I actually wish I had another image of that put them up against each other and then take like masking tape or clear tape and tape them. So on the left side, you have the green and on the right side, you have the red. And literally you could tell the kids, if things are good, put the green side, you know, in the middle of the table on the top. So I know things are good. When you hit a roadblock or a stumbling block or an obstacle and you're stuck, right? Red means stop, flip it over. Or you can keep them separate and you can just have the kids put whichever one they're, you know, if they're struggling, they put the red one on top and so on. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So here's a real um, high tech um, tool to use, two of them actually, in order to see that while you are teaching, are the kids understanding the material? So Nearpod and Pear Deck are very, very similar. I'm actually gonna show you two super short videos that are gonna explain them um, to you a little bit better than I actually can. But in a nutshell, basically what they both do is kids are going to log in um, with a code. 
and they're going to log into your presentation. And once they do that, you as the teacher at your teacher station, at your computer, you're controlling the kids' devices. So kind of like right now, you can't skip ahead and you cannot go back in my presentation because I'm controlling the pace of the webinar. It's the same thing when you're using Nearpod or Pear Deck. So think about how many times that you as a student or you as a learner, if you were sitting in a college class or sitting at a conference or wherever, whatever the situation, and you're given a Google slide deck or a PowerPoint or something done in Keynote and you're flipping back and forth, you're clicking on the links and you're kind of not really paying attention to what the instructor is, is or the presenter is speaking on. So using Nearpod and Pear, Te Pear Deck, it completely cuts that X factor out. Like you control their devices. And if they try to X out of it completely and leave, you get notified on your screen. So it's, it's a pretty cool tool. So um, it also takes PDFs, Google Slides, um, and PowerPoints, and you can easily load them in. So you don't have to sit there and kind of create things um, from scratch or recreate the wheel. So if you're already a teacher that you're teaching and you have lots of different things um, already created, you don't have to go now and say, oh, I gotta create something brand new in order to use uh, Nearpod or Pear Deck. Okay, so I'm gonna show a quick little video now. And as you're watching it, once again, if you have any questions, feel free to type in. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Nearpod first. Introducing Nearpod, an award-winning edtech tool trusted by millions of teachers and used by tens of thousands of schools and districts. Nearpod is a platform that easily allows teachers to create, download, and teach interactive lessons across all student devices, including Chromebooks, iPads, iPhones, and Android devices, and works on any operating system or browser. Nearpod works seamlessly with Google Classroom, and integrates with learning management systems like Canvas and Schoology. Teachers can easily upload their existing PowerPoints, PDFs, Google Slides, and Sways, and convert them into interactive Nearpod lessons by including engaging activities like quizzes, polls, draw-its, open-ended questions, fill-in-the-blanks, and 3D objects. And with Nearpod VR, teachers can take their students on a virtual field trip anywhere in the world. Nearpod VR works on any device, with or without headsets. Imagine taking students to the Taj Mahal, the Pyramids of Giza, the Washington Monument, or the Great Wall of China, all from the comfort of your classroom. Teachers launch a live lesson, students enter a lesson code, and the lesson is synced to all student devices. Teachers can also launch student-paced lessons, which allow students to complete a lesson on their own time wherever they are. Teachers get real-time feedback on student understanding and can access post-lesson reports to assess individual and class performance. Nearpod also has a library of thousands of ready-to-teach, standards-aligned K-12 lessons across all subjects from a curated list of distinguished publishers and authors, including Common Sense Education, Time for Kids, LearnZillion, ReadWorks, Education.com, and expert K-12 teachers from our Nearpod Authors Program. All lessons are editable and customizable to meet the needs of individual teachers and students. Schools and districts have access to special admin features that allow administrators to create and manage a private library of interactive lessons with teachers at their school. Nearpod also has exclusive in-person training and PD to ensure you get the most out of Nearpod's incredible features and benefits. Nearpod is the complete classroom solution that will transform your teaching and engage your students. Learn more at Nearpod.com. So how cool is that, right? I mean, simply amazing um, what you're able to do there. Um, and similar to that, we have Pear Deck. The biggest difference really between the two, because you're probably already thinking they're so, you know, um, they sound pretty similar from the description. Pear Deck integrates with Google tools. So if you have Google Drive and you're in a G Suite district, most of the time the teachers will use Pear Deck 
because um, it integrates directly with, with Drive. And, and you'll see that in um, this little quick video. Pear Deck will change the way you present slide decks in a live classroom setting. When you hit Start Presenting in Pear Deck, you're creating a live session for participants to join on their own computer, tablet, or smartphone. As the instructor, you control the flow of the presentation from your computer or tablet. On their devices, participants can respond to your pre-planned or impromptu questions throughout the presentation with a number of unique interaction types. Those responses can then be shared anonymously and in real time on your classroom projector or interactive whiteboard. From your device, you can isolate individual answers, toggle responses, and even do cool things like overlay all of the drawings your students have shared. Let's walk through a session to find out how. Okay, and then there's just another um, another video there for you if you want to go. So these are all on YouTube, by the way. So if anything interests you there, you could certainly um, take a look, uh, Google them, go to those websites, and and um, find out some more information. The really nice thing about those couple of things there, actually they didn't mention about Pear Deck, about the integration. The really cool thing there is whatever work that the kid has done during that lesson is saved in what they call a student takeaway, and it's stored directly into each student's individual Google Drive. So then it becomes like a study guide. So they're able to see what they covered in class, they can go back over it again and, and use it for review. So again, both of these tools are a great way in the moment, real time, to see are your kids really understanding the material, um, you know, and, and how are you going to use that data to better inform um, your instruction moving forward. Okay, this is one that I absolutely love, and here's a great um, no-tech form and of assessment. Um, I'm calling it Doodle It, um, but there's the, the real name for it is sketch noting or visual note taking. So if you take a look at what you see there, that is an actual sketch note. And basically what it is, it's a combination of images, words, and all those squiggly little lines and arrows that you see there are called connectors. And it's another way for kids to demonstrate what they know um, after you are teaching them whatever concept it is that you are teaching them. So in this particular case, this was a fifth grade student that um, after we read Number the Stars and we were studying the protagonist and the antagonist and we were learning about character traits. So what they had to do here was all throughout the course of the study of the novel, you know, we were talking about character traits and then, you know, I wanted to make sure that the kids truly understood what character traits best described this particular character. So they were asked to draw an image of the character, they were able to choose whether there was the protagonist or the antagonist, um, pick some character traits, and then they had to provide evidence from the text to support their answer. So in this particular case, this was two students that did this together. They had the text available to them. Um, and this was after, this was like halfway through the book. I wanted to see if they had a good understanding of the character because in that book, there is a change um, in the characters and I wanted to make sure that they understood where the character was at at this point in the novel. And then toward the end, they were gonna do this again so they'd be able to see the change in the character. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Any questions, Sharon, or should I just keep going? Actually, I'm kind of collecting questions. So if you wanna take a few minutes and answer some. Um, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, first of all, we have a bunch of people who are learning about this now, I'm guessing in their classes, so that's really good. Um, so this is gonna be great for them. Um, there's a couple of questions about somebody who has never used this before, although they know about it, and learning how to collect and view the spreadsheet appears to be the confusion with a couple of people. Someone wants to know, in, in the early slides when you were showing how you did your um, your Google like surveys and stuff, and then how do you see the results? People were asking questions like, how do you see the results? How do you collect the data on the spreadsheet? So that seems to be... Okay. Okay. All right, so you want me to address that first? Sure, yeah. Okay, so I literally can do an entire hour just on Google Forms. <laughs> so um, it's kind of hard to walk you through the entire process right now. Um, but what I will do for you, let me go back to see. 
All right, let me go back to the Google Sheet that we had open. So this is basically the way that it works. Let me just set this up. Give me one second here. I don't want too many things open. Okay, so here is that original Google form, right? How do you feel about your child entering? Let's see, enter, oh, there it is. Entering middle school. So there's the question. You notice at the top of the form, there's a tab for questions and there's a tab for responses. When you click on the response, you're going to um, have access right here. If you see this green icon, that's the Google spreadsheet. So when you click on that spreadsheet, it's going to bring you to all of the data. So it automatically gathers and collects the data for you. All the people are doing, the students, the parents, whoever it may be, they're typing in the answers and the responses to the Google form. And then it automatically gets sent over to a spreadsheet. Okay, I think that's answering the question. Right, so if this is something that you're just learning about and you really don't understand the ins and outs of Google Forms, please let Sharon know if you're interested and I could, we could absolutely schedule a webinar literally just on Google Forms and I can walk you through them step by step. Because right now I'm just assuming you know how to use them um, but if there's a bunch of you that don't, that's something Sharon and I can can definitely um, set up. Because, you know, it takes a little bit of tech savviness to be able to create them. Um, how does that sound, Sharon? Is that is that okay? A lot of people are learning about it now, and they know about it, and they're just not, you know, experts at it yet. But somebody did ask, how do you set it up for the parents if they don't have their own Google accounts? So um, it, it doesn't matter. Actually, um, right now, you don't have to have a Google account. You're able to create the form and it generates an actual link. Let me actually go back here. See this button here up on the top where it says send? I'm gonna click on that. And you can send it via email. So you can literally just send it out that way. Or what you can do is you can click on this little button and it generates a link. And you can see here how ridiculously long it is. So I always like to shorten that link. And then you can copy and paste that. You can put it on a website. You could tweet it out. You could put it um, on your Facebook page. You can send it in an email and that will give them access. You no longer have to have a Gmail account in order to be able to answer a Google form. That's great. And so it doesn't, parents, that does not matter. And someone else asked, do the parents log into your account? No, they just use this link, right? No. That's no, they just click the link. Okay. Um, I have one question about Nearpod, and then we'll continue. Sure. But um, someone wants to know, do you have to have an administrator code to use Nearpod? No, you do not. Okay. So you, you would just set up your account as a teacher. You don't have to have the administrator one. That's if you wanted to do it school-wide. Um, and the administrator would want to set up um, a library of lessons that you as a staff create and you want to keep that private to your district. Um, but to be honest with you, most most people, most teachers are just using this on their own and using the public library that's already created. Okay, great, thank you. And quite a few people are saying yes, they would love a webinar on Google Forms. <laughs> okay, all right, Sharon, we'll talk about that. That's, that's super easy. Okay. Okay. So all right, let's see. Um, okay, so sketch, sketch noting. So that's, that's um, this idea here. So it's, it's basically a way of letting kids draw um, using images along with linear notes, you know, words and whatever to show what they know. And this is a great thing you can do as an exit ticket. So whatever it is that you just taught, I mean, let's go think about um, kindergarten, first grade, right? The little kids, you're teaching addition, subtraction. Um, and after you've taught that concept and you could literally just hand them an, an index card or a piece of paper, or if you want them to do it in Google, like older kids could do it in Google drawings, or if you're in a district that has iPads and there's some sort of a drawing app that they can use, you could say to them, show me using pictures what you just learned. So if it's a math concept, you could just say, you know, okay, we learned addition today, um, draw a math problem, you know, explain to me your thinking. Okay, moving on to something a little bit more um, techy here. 
this is an app, uh, an, I shouldn't say it's not an app, it's a web platform that I really, really like. It's called Answer Garden. And um, what this enables you to do is to ask your students a question and right there in real time get an immediate response. And these are more simple questions. It's usually yes or no or multiple choice, things along those lines. So usually when I do this, I'm, I'm able to send you guys a link, you would respond, and we would see our real time results. Um, but what I did here was I gave you um, an image. So if I click on this link here, um, here's a question um, that you could give out to your, your um, and I use this when I do a lot of trainings. Tell us one thing you learned that you are excited about. So as your students type in the answer, it generates this word cloud right here. You could see Pear Deck is super popular. 14 people from the last time I did this training, 14 out of the group really like Pear Deck. And the way word clouds work is the more you respond with the same answer, the larger it is. So you can see here, Google Classroom was a big hit, Pear Deck, and you could see Pear Deck is here again. So it's really 18 people because they didn't put a space there. Um, and down here, people put exclamation points. So that's basically the way um, that works. The only thing that I don't like about Answer Garden is that you as the teacher have to constantly refresh the screen in order for your word cloud to grow. So what you would do is you put it up on your smart board or you would, you would put it up on some sort of screen for the kids to see. Um, and up here, you have your little refresh button. You would have to keep clicking that to see your word cloud grow. And that's Answer Garden. Um, Chrissy, I'm sorry. That's something again. Yes. Can I ask two things? Someone wants to know if Answer sure. is Answer Garden a free tech tool? Yes. It is free. Okay. And is yes. there what's the cost to use Nearpod lessons pre made? That's a question that came out. You know what? I honestly don't know. Um, I don't use Nearpod, I use Pear Deck. I'm not really sure. You'd have to go to the website and they'd probably be able to give you more information there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's another no tech option. Um, this is called three times summarization. And after you've taught something in a particular lesson, a mini, again, it doesn't really matter. All of these things can be used in any content area, any subject, any grade level. So you have kids focus on whatever it is that you're teaching them at that moment, and they have to summarize it three times. So the first time they're only allowed to use 100 words. So you can have them do this in a Google Doc. Um, if you're in a Microsoft 365, I think they're up to now, in that distri a district like that. Um, so you can have them do it on a device. You can have them do it on an index card. You can have them do it on, well, I guess 100 words. You'd be doing it on a piece of paper. And they have to summarize what you just taught or whatever the big idea is in 100 words. That's something most kids, if they're paying attention, they can do. But here's where it gets tricky. And here's where you're really able to see, did they really get it? Now have them have that off to the side and say, okay, so now what I want you to do is the same thing, but I want you to only use 50 words. So now the kids have to really think critically about what information they need to best express themselves and the idea that you just taught. But this is not so easy for some kids. And then the very last um, option here is to do the 10 word summary. And that's really, really hard. That really shows you if a kid fully grasps the concept that you taught, because they're gonna have to know those key words, be able to string them together in a way that makes sense. So it's kind of like if you're on Twitter and you only have 140 characters to say what you wanna say, you get pretty darn creative in whatever way you can to use up those 140 characters. It's a very, um, very similar, similar idea here. Um, and if you really want to be innovative, instead of doing it on paper or on index cards or something like that, you can have them do an exit ticket where um, they're tweeting it out or they're tweeting it to you. Um, so you can see, do they fully understand it? And of course, you'd be doing that in a district that A, allows you to use Twitter, um, and B, kids that are 13 or older, and if they already have their own Twitter 
um, accounts. So that's something you would have to find out ahead of time. Um, but actually, you know, asking them to tweet to you, what did you learn today in 140 characters is a higher tech version of this three times summary activity. Um, this is a great, these games, right? Making a game out of it. All of these different icons that you see here um, are all different formative assessment tools that you can use in the moment to see if kids are understanding what you're teaching. And what I really like about them is it gamifies whatever it is that you're, you're the content that the kids are learning about. And, and it's, a, you know, it's, they're engaging, they're fun. I think out of everything you see here, Kahoot, this one right here is the most popular. And you will probably see that in lots and lots of classrooms today. Second to that is uh, Quizlet. And Quizlet, basically, what it allows you to do is, as a teacher, you can create um, flashcards. You can have questions on one side and answers on the other. You can have vocabulary words on one side and their terms on the other. And the kids have time over the course of a day, two days for homework or whatever, to study them and learn them. And there's little games along the way for them to play individually. But the really cool feature is something called Quizlet.live. So once they've studied it, uh, you are able to go in, click a button, it creates groups, and kids have to answer the questions or figure out the vocabulary um, in groups. And the neat thing about it is they're forced to talk to each other. They're forced to collaborate. Because if you have four kids in the group, only one out of the four has the correct answer on their screen. So all of these other ones here, Socrative, Quizalize, Jewels of Wisdom, Formative, and Quiz Is, are all different types of games that you can play in the classroom um, to see if the kids fully understand what you're teaching. And most of them have some sort of report or data that you can print out so that you can see individually who's getting it and who's not. Who do you have to pull for that small group? Who needs extra homework in this area? Who do you need to hold in you know, from recess or stay after school because they need a little bit of extra help? Uh, let me think. There was one more thing I was going to say about it, and I, it just mm -hmm. escaped me. Hmm. Oh, to put a flip on it, um, what I did with my third graders this year, we played Kahoot a couple of times so they understood the way the game worked. But at the end of a unit, so this is summative assessment now, instead of giving them a test, they had the option, I gave them a whole menu, it's called a choice board, It's kind of like a little menu of like a bingo board, so to speak. And I gave them choices of ways that they could show me what they learned. And one of them was to either create Quizlet, a set of cards that we could play Quizlet.live as a class together, or to create their very own Kahoot with questions and answers, and then we would play them as a group. So this year I did that after we studied the moon, and it was amazing. These are third graders, eight-year-olds. Um, all I did was help them set up their individual accounts, and then I just let them go at it. And it was amazing what they actually created. And the sense of satisfaction when they stood at the teacher computer, they started the game. Myself, I made myself the learner, and I sat there with the other kids, and you know, I logged in like them and played the game along with them. It was amazing um, the work that they did and how proud they were. And it's another way of kids to show what they know instead of the age old quiz, test, essay, research project, um, things along those lines. So that's something a little bit more innovative. Any more questions, Sharon, or can I move on? Yes, there are a few. Um, one question, okay. someone wants to know, would any of these games be um, work for kindergartners? Oh, Kahoot, absolutely. Okay. Quizlet, definitely. I mean, you could put their sight words on there um, or vocabulary words from stories. I mean, kids in kindergarten today are doing what kids in first grade did years ago. So there's like, you know, that whole push down there that, you know, kids are expected to do more. So, yeah, absolutely. Even if it's something simple as color words, you could put a color like Quizlet. Um, you could put the, the word on one side of the flashcard. And then you could put a square or a circle. You can add images to it of a color. Um, it's great for ESL kids. Quizlet is, is excellent for that. I mean, Kahoot or any of these games also, because you can add images to most of them. Oh, that's so good. it's ways for kids to learn vocabulary and, and um, you know, that language acquisition um, phase that they're going through. 
Great. Thank you. And someone else just made a comment that they're constantly talking about using uh, about UDL, Universal Design for Learning Choices, and that these choices are great to give kids a choice board with these options to create their own quiz and things like that. Yeah. 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 That's a whole, <laughs> we should talk about that one, student-centered learning. That's a whole, <laughs> you know, another hour we could spend talking about that. But yeah, choice boards and menu boards and giving kids options instead of everybody sitting down, taking the same quiz, the same test, or writing an essay um, to give the kids options. And it's, you know, interesting, I had a couple of kids do a Kahoot, a couple of kids did, you know, Quizlet. Um, I still had kids that I gave them those big pieces of chart paper, and they did the old school, like, poster. But then I had another kid, uh, two kids that took that chart paper, and they did, like, a large sketch note of it. So you never know. Um, some kids may want to write the essay. It's not to say that it's bad. Um, it's just another option. Sure. Any other questions? Because I feel like we're running out of time. Very quick one is that the Pear Deck. What's the quest for Pear Deck? You, you use that pre-made lessons. That's I know there's a free version and a paid version. Um, I don't know because the district paid for it. So off the top of my head, I have no idea what that costs. Okay, but there is a free version as well. Yeah, there's a free version. Great. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Um, no tech version. We talked a little bit about exit cards, but here's one that I really like. Um, you could either, if you Google around for exit tickets, there's lots of different ones that you can do. You could do it on a Google form. You can use an index card. You can literally um, make one of these. But this one I like, the three, two, one. Three things I learned while reading or three things I learned from today's lesson, whatever it may be. Two interesting facts and then one question I still have. And then as they're walking out the door, they can't leave until they take a couple of minutes to answer this. So this is really great when they're walking out, you can get a quick, you know, take, you know, immediately take the pulse of the kids sitting in your class. Like, did they get it or not? What do they still have questions about? Well, guess what? Those are gonna be embedded into your lesson uh, tomorrow or the next day or so on um, to make sure that they fully understand what you're talking about. So a lot of these no tech ones, you literally, if you wanted to, could turn around and use them tomorrow in your classroom. It takes a very little prep. So this one is not so high tech. This one is called low tech. And I discovered this a few years ago when the park test first came out and nobody really knew what they were doing in, in terms of like managing devices. And my Chromebook cart, which I had every single day access to every single day, except for six weeks during park testing, they took away that cart and I only had it during park testing. And the uh, it was used for other grade levels in other classrooms when my grade level was not teaching, uh, testing at that time, sorry. So what Plickers does, and you can take a look at that um, picture here, is these little weird funky images that you see right here, these black and white images. Um, it comes in a set of, I think 26 or 30 of them. And you can see there's different letters here, letters and numbers, one, B, A, G, and so on. So what you simply do is you can just ask a question and the kids, you can see them holding it up and it's whatever direction is on top is the correct answer. And then with a smartphone or an iPad, because you literally only need one device here, if you stand at the front of the room, you're able to scan, they take a quick picture, uh, image, capture an image, and it automatically, you could see up here, pops up on your screen. So there's definitely a learning curve here. You would probably have to go on YouTube and sit through a little tutorial on how to actually set it up. Um, but it requires very, very little technology, literally only one device. So what I did for you, um, I'm gonna show you here when I click on this image on the right, I realize it's not an interactive, uh, keep forgetting it's not interactive here. Um, it's going to, once it loads, it actually gives you, and this is free as well, the Plickers cards. So all you simply have to do is click on it, download it, and print it. And a little word of advice, do not laminate them. If that's the first thing, especially elementary teach school teachers love to laminate everything. Um, do not. What I suggest you do is print them on cardstock so they're a little bit more solid and they don't um, damage easily. But if you laminate them, what happens is when you stand at the front and you try to take an image of it, there, there's a glare that is created and it, it doesn't capture um, perfectly. Any questions about plickers? This one definitely you have to go in and kind of play with it a little bit. 
It requires you to create a teacher account. Kids are going to, um, you're going to put the kids' names in. You're going to create that class set. Um, you're going to give each kid one of these funky little images here. And then it's automatically going, however they do that, you know, in the background, it works, it's magic. Um, and it's going to collect their answers and put it up on a screen um, so you can see. Now, it's an option if you want to project that screen so the kids can see if they got the answers right or wrong. And you can clearly see here, kids that got it correct are in green, kids that got it wrong are in red. Um, one of the things that I like to do is instead of my kids signing in with their real name, um, I make them create little gamer tags. So any of you in the audience that play video games of any kind, they create gamer tags. I know who they are because I make them give me that gamer tag at the beginning of the year and I have a little spreadsheet that has their name on one side and their gamer tag on the other. But each other, the kids don't know who each other is. So they don't literally use the gamer tag from the video games because a lot of these kids will play together and they'll know. I make them create a unique one um, for class purposes. So the kids don't need to, you know, the kids that are struggling or really don't understand, so they're not embarrassed by their name always being in red. So hopefully that, um, that makes sense. So here's a no tech uh, formative assessment. It's called hand in, pass out. And this is done anonymously. So after you teach, whatever it is you teach, and it could be a lesson that's over the course of two days or three days. Mind you, all of these can be adapted in any way. It doesn't you don't have to do these assessments every single day. So if you're teaching something, it may be a lesson that only takes 20 minutes, or it may be a lesson that's carried over three days or four days, and on Friday, you know, you're doing this assessment. So what hand in, pass out literally is, you're either handing them a piece of paper, um, and that's the best way to do it, is hand them a piece of paper, give them a prompt, or ask them what they learned, or give them a question you want them to respond to, and they write it down. Then you give, you know, set a little timer, collect it after 10 minutes or however long it is, shuffle them up, um, and mind you, no names, and then you hand them out to the other kids, making sure that they don't get their own. And then you go over that key information. Either you answer the question or the key vocabulary that needs to be included, or these are the details that should be there, or these are the character traits that you should have chosen, and this is the evidence that supports it. And the kids kind of get used to seeing what other people are are doing, they're able to correct the work, um, but they don't know who they belong to. And right then and there, they're able to see, um, you're able to get an idea of, okay, who, again, who understands it, who doesn't, and then you collect it back. How many of the kids got it? Did the majority get it? Is it only two or three kids that didn't understand the material? And so on. Poll Everywhere um, is another platform like Answer Garden except it looks slightly different here. Um, so Poll Everywhere allows you to ask a question. And again, these are simple um, true and false or multiple choice questions. And this is what the data looks like. So what you would do is you would go into Poll Everywhere. You would create the question. It will give you um, different ways for the kids to respond. So it'll either give you a QR code. So if you have kids that have smartphones or I, um, iPads, they can literally go up and scan it. It could give you a link that you can push out to them via email or if you're using Google Classroom or Schoology or any other um, learning management system. Um, so however you want to, however you are able to con um, give, uh, send out that link. Or if you're doing something like this on Nearpod or Pear Deck or even just Google Slides, you can take the link and just literally put the link on the slides and the kids just click on it. So you would ask your question. So this one is how often do you check tweets, Facebook and email? Um, and the response is choices where every five minutes, every 30 minutes, once an hour or once a day. So as the kids are answering, you're able to see it right then and there. So this is great for a do now or, um, or an exit ticket. Any questions, Sharon? No, we're good. Okay. Um, and we're kind of winding down here. These are the last few. So another no tech option, you can actually see it in action on the board, is something called a chalkboard splash, where you ask a question or you give a prompt or you ask the kids to explain their thinking at the same time. So they don't have an opportunity to look at each other's work. Um, so what you could do here is if you're doing this in small groups, you can literally have them go to the board right on a whiteboard. Um, or what I've done in the past is I put kids in groups 
I give them large sheets of chart paper and it's just, okay, here's the prompt, here's the question, here's the concept we just learned, explain your thinking, go. And I give them a certain amount of time, the buzzer goes off, then we all stand back and we'll look at one sheet of chart paper at a time and we look and we analyze the answers. And again, it's anonymous, because in the end it's, it's, you know, once you're looking at them all together, it's hard to see who was standing there and so on. And then you look for trends, you look for gen, you know, generalizations. Um, did most of them have the key vocabulary? Did most of them understand the concept behind, you know, that math skill or whatever it may be? And then, you know, it's very, very clear when there are deficits. You're like, wow, like nobody included this in their answer. Nobody included that. And by the way, you should not be the one analyzing the responses. Let the kids do the heavy lifting. Let them do the work. You know, you can have the kids, you know, gather around and take, we call this a gallery walk. So if you do it with poster, um, large uh, sheets of um, like those large post-it notes or, or chart paper, after they all do their responses, give each kid two sticky notes or three sticky notes and give them 10 minutes to walk around and look at each um, you know, response and then write down on their little clipboard with their sticky notes, you know, something that they noticed that every, most of the kids understood, something that most of the kids missed and maybe something that needs to be worked on. And that's what we call a gallery walk. And you could do that in, again, for, for just about anything that you're teaching. Um, and here what I gave you was lots and lots of uh, resources for formative assessment. And you know what, Sharon, as I'm talking, I just realized no. they can't click on any of these links. Oh. Well, you know what, when we, send, when we send out the, the information, Maybe you can just put the links, you know, give me the links and I can put that into the email. Yeah, and here's the other thing I was going to, um, and here's more additional resources here. Um, and then here's also, so they're gonna be able to see this whole presentation, right? Yes. Okay, so my email is also there. So if anybody has any questions moving forward, so this may sound all great and it might make sense to you right now. And if I said to you, if you were sitting in front of me, Give me, you know, two thumbs up if this is all cool and you feel comfortable walking away from here. But in September, when school rolls around and you want to use something and you're like, oh my gosh, what did she mean by that? You can always reach out to me. So my Twitter handle is here at the Connected EDU. Um, two emails that you can reach me at. Um, my cell phone is there. You can always shoot me a text as well. Um, and Sharon will figure out a way for me to send them the actual link to the set of slides. So they're able to access all of the uh, additional links. That'd be great. I mean, we did record this session, so we're going to put it on our YouTube channel. Um, okay. I can send them a PDF of this. And also, you know, maybe we can just put the links in there. Maybe I can add them in before I send it out or something. There's a lot. There's uh, a lot there. So I can actually send it to you if you want to do that. That's fine. Okay. But we'll talk about that later. So any lingering questions um, before you go? I'm not seeing everyone saying thank you. And I do want to say thank you. I also want to let everybody know be, if, in case any questions come in right now, just let you all know that Chrissy is not only doing tonight's webinar, but you probably got the email. She's doing one next Wednesday night as well on innovative approaches to literacy. And then in the end of August on the 30th, think outside the box with Google Classroom. And um, because there seems to be such interest about the Google Forms, uh, Chrissy and I will be talking about doing something on Google Forms. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just really, really quick, um, take 10 seconds, please, if you guys don't mind. Um, I would love to know out of all the different types of formative assessment that you just learned about, which one are you most excited to put into practice if you were going to walk into a classroom tomorrow? And if you could just um, type that to Sharon, that would be great. I would love to see what you found the most interesting uh, to use. Um, also want to let you know, as far as the certificate goes for this, we're working on it. I'll let you know in the email. And the last thing is when you do click out of here, you're going to get a short little survey. So in the survey, if you don't have time to type right now, um, what you, which, um, you know, formative assessment tool you like, you can put it on the survey and, and I'll be able to collect that. It's, it's kind of like a Google form that you're going to be getting. <laughs> so. Yeah. Thank you all um, for coming. And Chrissy, thank you. It was really great. Oh, you're welcome. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody. Let me just see if there's anything else. Oh, Kahoot. My kindergarten students.
Answer Garden. This is what people are saying. Near Pond and Pear. So everyone's saying everything. So that's great. Cool. Okay. So great. thank you all very much. And um, hopefully we'll see you next Wednesday night. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Thank you. Bye, everybody.